Welcome everybody to another episode of AdsCast. Uh, we're now in February, so the end of January means two things. One, the weather's going to start getting a little bit warmer. And two, transfer deadline day, which of course is one of the most eagerly anticipated days of the entire football calendar. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today by broadcaster uh, Tony Afoke. Uh, Tony has appeared on TalkSport regularly, so you'll probably have heard his dulcet tones. Uh, and you can catch him again tomorrow on kickoff with Hugh Wozencroft, where he'll be joined by uh, Martin Samuel. So anyone who's an eager reader of any uh, football journalist, you'll know Martin um, for time immemorial, it seems. So, Tony, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, join me today, especially considering undoubtedly it was a late finish for you last night. Um, what sort of time did you sort of eventually sign off? Oh, well, I was actually one of the lucky ones where I was working in working in the morning but I still had to stay on the top of everything so I kind of signed off I reckon 1 1 a.m that's sounds... obviously the deadlines <clears throat> deadlines done but then clubs like officially announced players until like 12 and then all the paperwork things to make sure that some some uh, players have got through over the line who has sent their faxes who hasn't stuff like that so yeah I kind of signed off at 1 a.m so. it's kind of mad isn't it because you've got the you've got the deadline officially which is 11 o'clock then it turns out that's just the deadline to get the deal sheet in then they're given another hour to get it done then it can take them up to another hour to actually announce it and you're sitting there going what's going on <laughs> it's just a bit mad really yeah honestly like for for the the average fan i only say the average fan but for most of us it's just like what are they doing how long does it take to, to actually do a transfer and there's so many things and so many like variables you have to get through in a short amount of time so so like yeah it's i know that we all think it's 11 everything has to be done by then but it's just the first part has to be done by 11 and then the rest doesn't get announced until the next morning or a couple of hours after so like from your perspective then working in the media i mean it must be the most chaotic day obviously you've got one in august one in january they must be the most chaotic days because you've got stuff coming in from everywhere all the various sources some of it real some of it just made up you're having to deal with ins and outs and last minutes you know you've got stuff which might take the whole window stuff which is like from nowhere how do you deal with all of that all coming in at like once it's it's really hectic because normally you have like a specific team to sort out transfers and then for everyone else that's broadcasting it we all like feed off that team or that person but now because of twitter and social media it's i think the game's completely changed like if you can get you can get people saying this deal's done and half of it is just nonsense like you, i think you can tell the nonsense from like the actual real stuff but you can get some people saying yeah this deal's done or this deal's gonna happen like no one literally in the, in the morning my, i'll give you an example marcel said it to, to man united no one had a clue no one had a clue we all thought we only just found out that Ericsson was going to be injured for May. That was the news for May United. And then the news was like, okay, so May United won't sign a midfielder. And then within the hours, it just happens, all things just break. And then everything was like, oh, I'm hearing Marcel Sabitzer might go to May United or Chelsea. Oh, he might go to May United. Oh, he's missed training today. And then it just all unfolds. So I think social media is a massive thing with the transfer deadline day. Like it's completely changed the way um, it used to be done. So. It's, it's it's another source but again with with the internet you, you need to be careful of what you consider a source nowadays no totally i mean where when something like that sort of starts breaking you have all these random people saying like like sabitza for example where where do they get those nuggets from is it typically from a club is it somebody close to the player because like you just said that came from nowhere that was a really mm. really sort of last minute opportunity I would say, so let's say like a journalist, one thing I know about the journalists is where they get their sources from is either an agent, they might be close to the agent or they might be close to a certain person or a certain insider in the club. But most of these agents, are, so like some journalists will be like, the, the real ones will be like, okay, I've heard this from the agent, I'm going to say this, like I guess with, let's look at Fabrizio uh, Romano, for example, is that I know that he will ha have most of his sources from agents or most of his sources from people inside the club that will tell him what to tell him what's going on and he will relay the information slowly but surely which is again it's 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 a way for him because this is like a big day for him he was just out here with all of these yesterday like everyone was just fishing for twitter feeds so he so he he and other journalists kind of know what's happening like 
they relay all the information to me and then they and they just feed it out to the public slowly but surely because his his track record is like unusually high like if he says something it's like 90 percent bang on and then obviously he says right here we go everyone starts copying that now and it's done but you get other people who try and sort of maraud as being connected or whatever they're all on twitter and their rates are just way down so they're obviously they're just regurgitating whatever they hear so it must be difficult to kind of like filter through in terms of what are you going to relay let's say you're doing a broadcast you know what piece of gossip or potential transfer are you going to talk about what are you going to ignore um same with managers incomings and outgoings like we just saw with everton recently there was bielsa there was Deich. um it must be quite difficult to be able to filter out a lot of the noise and just say right this is this is potential because you don't want to come across as just spouting because otherwise people won't listen to what you're going to say right it must be quite difficult to pick pick your sources yeah 100 percent, and that's one thing in media as well is that we've got to be careful with what sources we use like if i let's say if one of the show is on right now and i've come to them and been like i've just seen this on twitter I need to make sure my source is good before we start feeding it to the public because you don't want to be wrong. You don't. So there's a fine line between like us tweeting out saying, for instance, talk sport understands or this is going to happen. So we need to be very careful with our source. But I feel like the main sources in football nowadays are transfers with David Ornstein of the Athletic and Patricio Romano. I think those two, obviously, you have your, your Gianni Luca Di Marzio, you have your, let's say, Pletti goals and some other people that are quite reliable and there's some other reliable journalists around the world but you've just got to be careful because as, as I like to say now that we have Twitter and now that people have information anyone can be a journalist nowadays which is not a slight on journalists but it's just it's just the truth anyone can share a piece of information and whether it's right or wrong with the right audience it can be believable so you've really got to be careful of like what in fact you want to put out there and, and what, what you need to know like if we see anything from Fabrizio or David Orsi, we kind of take it for what it is. But at the same time, if we see, if we want to be, the, I think it's one of them ones. You, I know you, everyone wants to be the first to do something, but you'd rather be right than be the first. Very good point. Yeah, very good point. People, there, there's two things in there. There's like being the first to break something, but then there's the person that if you, like, a bit like Fabrizio Romano, sometimes his Twitter feed will go quiet. But when he says something like, here we go, done 100 yeah. percent. you take that as gospel and i think that's more valuable like you just said than sometimes being five or ten minutes quicker than somebody else but you got it right yeah exactly like that's that's what it is at the end of the day you want to be the first you don't want to be the first you want to be the person to get it right the person that get, gets it right is the one that's more reliable and seen as more reliable so it's not about it's not always about being first i agree with you i mean the other thing of course you see with the the live streamers now that you know they'll talk about potential formations or they'll talk about personnel and what and whatever uh and a lot of the time they're wrong they, they they talk you know logically and you can understand where they're coming from and they'll say that they've been speaking with so and so or whatever source but maybe 50 percent of the time they're right whereas if you like you just said if you've got a trusted source like the athletic or fabrizio then if they're going to put it out there it, it's it's pretty much a done thing no, I, I agree. With with those two, it's pretty much a dumb thing nowadays as soon as they say it. Especially David Ornstein recently, he's mm. been very quite reliable. With he's sometimes even quicker to Fabrizio Romano. I know in the summer there was a lot. I think people were saying that David Ornstein was taking over Fabrizio, like it's a battle really? between them. But but now but nowadays it's so I think those two you kind of have it in American sports as well, with um Woj and Shams. So when it comes to basketball with Adrian I don't know how to pronounce his surname, but like Wojnarowski or something like that, but we just call him Woj. If Woj says something, you take it as gospel. If Sham says something, you take it as gospel. So those are the two journalists. Mm. And so, and we're kind of getting that in football now. You never really used to have that back then. I know Fabrizio used to, he used to be him, but now it's just David Ornstein and Fabrizio. If them two say something's going to happen, more likely it's going to happen. Yeah, I, I can kind of get that. I guess, I mean, it's, it's like we, we're seeing top level football move more into that kind of american style it's like theater it's like entertainment it's commercial and so i guess it's like only natural that you'll get people who are sort of within that environment trust with the players who are then able to sort of pass on what's really going down pretty much bang on 
it's probably taken a while for us to have the same kind of trust, I guess. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's taken us. It's taken us a while, but now we're starting to get those. I said we started to get standout journalists that we're going to take their word away, and I feel like Fabrizio and David are going to be those guys for the next transfer windows to come for us to actually be like, okay, whatever these guys say, this is it, because any journalist can the news and there's a lot of journalists that are quicker than the others and there's a lot of verified journalists that get stuff wrong but i think those two i feel like they're only trying to put out stuff that's actually correct well and also you know if you're a certain journalist who's got integrity who's uh not averse to interviewing the likes of harry kane or ledley king or anyone of that nature uh maybe there might be room for um a tony afoke to uh, join that party soon you never know <laughs> You never know. I, I, I need to find a bit a better catchphrase, and here we go. But uh, <laughs> it's on. You can have that one. It's on. <laughs> yeah. It's on. Boom, oh, boom, boom. There we go. Done. Do it. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. So, in the transfer window itself, then, are you are you a fan of it, or do you um, do you kind of because for for me, I remember sort of eighties and nineties and noughties before the transfer window, where you could bring players in almost any any time. Um, obviously, I remember Man United buying players like Andy Cole and Eric Cantona and Roy Keane and all these kind of players at random points throughout the season. And I remember Wenger joining Arsenal and bringing some, I can't remember his name. I don't think he ever had a particularly good career. Patrick Vieira, I think he joined. <laughs> and that was, but that, that was outside of like what was now the transfer window. And then obviously you only had those two points that you could, and it seemed quite restrictive. But now with the drama and everything, uh i've sort of been converted i think i kind of really do enjoy the transfer window for that kind of climax type type thing do you, are you a fan of it yeah 100 percent. I've, I've grown up with the transfer window so it's it's a massive thing for me like i was i remember the first time i ever started working with jim white i used to say like i used to watch you on with your yellow tie like, <laughs> there the we are there we are back in the day so so it's it's the whole spectacle of it now like that people remember like Harry Harry Redknapp out, um, taking interviews outside of his outside of his car window <laughs> the, 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 the range the Range like Rover roll, roll the window yeah, down exactly. and the, the old wheeler dealer yeah like there's there's so many stories left in the transfer window so I love the spectacle that actually come and I love the I don't want to say the panic but we like to see clubs be proactive mm. in their last days because some people were fine and some people will be like you know what I, I don't want to do this or and then actually you know you go and tie someone like I remember when United signed Anthony Martial like that was on the transfer deadline day in the summer and we wasn't linked we were barely linked with him then I remember signing Berbatov then we were barely linked with him then and then it gets done and then you're thinking is he going to get by like the anticipation of it it's 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 a great thing so I, I'm I'm always here for it I know like back in the day you can sign anyone and I feel like now the way we can spend money I think it makes it better because if Imagine if <clears> Chelsea <throat> didn't have a transfer window, they would just buy anyone they want constantly. And right now, at least there's a window in which you can do that. So I'll, yeah, I'm always for the transfer window. I think it's a great spectacle and it's a great, great thing that is in football. You're definitely right about those um, about those stories. Like I, I, it used to be like a tradition that you'd have somebody from Sky or Talksport, whatever, they'd find Harry and they'd say, Harry, what do you think of so-and-so? And they'd say, oh, he's terrific, terrific. There's no, there's no, whatever. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, I'm happy with my squad and whatever. And then like an hour later, he's gone and signed him, you know, uh, Nico Cranchar's joined Nico him. Nico Cranchar, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Defoe, Crouch, <laughs> Cran Cranchar, uh, get the whole gang back together. Um, and then, and then the other one was, uh, oh, do you remember Peter Oden Wingy? Yeah, yeah, when, when, he, was, he, when he traveled up, yeah, he spent the whole <laughs> spent the whole day outside the the ground, and then it turned out it um it sort of fell down. So those those kind of stories, I I totally get. And then you see on like the text, don't you? Like so and so's dog's best friend's grandma has seen so and so flying on a helicopter. Like Fernando, mm -hmm. I remember when Torres moved to Chelsea, and they were like, "Oh, Fernando Torres has been spotted house hunting in in whatever." Uh, so those kind of stories are like, uh, are. are yeah, I can see, I can see the appeal, and then you see those snippets like so and so leaving the training ground, and like, oh, he's wearing the shirt, and yeah, those were um, that, that that kind of thing. And then Jim with his tie, you're absolutely right. And then he has the big tick, uh, the big ticking clock, and um, yeah, that that's kind of swung it. The only thing which I I don't like is in the summer, you've got almost a month of your squad 
and then you could lose like your star player like let's say somebody starts the season on fire and somebody puts in a ridiculous bid but you've got no time to replace them so you start the squad you know start the season with you know whatever you might lose that player i i, I can understand why manager is a bit um uh i guess annoyed with the, the the august deadline obviously it was worse when we had it in september but yeah over, overall you're right the spectacle is is it's, it's pretty something i mean last night you must have had thousands of people tuning in to listen oh yeah 100 percent. we had so many people we're doing a live stream on the on court tour as well we did have a double fight in jordan um <clears throat> came back in the evening to do it like it was just it's just a big thing nowadays like it only happens twice a year so it's it's, it's a massive thing and everyone shoots into it everyone wants to know what's going on for their clubs and stuff like that so yeah it's a massive spectacle <clears throat> the, fun <clears throat> the funny thing is um yesterday uh newcastle playing southampton obviously beat them got to the league cup final and it was almost as if everyone forgot that there was there were games taking place it was um it was it was kind of like uh you get these announcements like oh yeah by the way newcastle won they're in the final anyway next transfer story and it's kind yeah. of, it just it just takes over and yeah. you know I, I was guilty i had the um i had the sky sports live feed on last night um and i had you know i had people at like bbc i had fabrizio um, I had talk sport as well. So, you know, to see who was, because yeah, they've got different sources. So they'll be talking about different stories at different times. And then the funny one, of course, was Hakim Zayic, where very, very late, it looked like Chelsea and PSG had agreed this, uh, this loan. He'd flown to Paris, sitting ready to do a medical or whatever he needed to do. And it just seems to have fallen apart. It's just random. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of um, players flying to medicals without like it being a hundred percent i feel like once a player flies for a medical it should be it should it should get done like i know people fail medicals and stuff like that mm. but I, I found that one really weird last night that he flew all the way and it just it didn't seem to happen in the end but when i was thinking like do do psg even need him i'm thinking about it like do psg actually need him like psg made a lot of signs in the summer obviously you have Mbappe, M messi neymar but they signed um, Eddie TK as well, who's been playing, who's been playing well. So I, I'm, I'm looking at it. I don't think PSG actually really needed him in the sense. Maybe Chelsea needed to offload a player. Obviously, Ziyech was a player that wasn't getting a much, a much game time. Mm. And now with all the signings, I doubt he's going to get game time. But I found it weird. If the player flies all the way, surely they must have a guarantee of like this is going to happen. And maybe it fell through last minute. Yeah, and also because if you look at say Enzo Fernandez. I mean that that looked like it was going to happen. He did his medical in Portugal, so yeah. they could have done all that kind of stuff beforehand, and then literally just shot in a plane just to sign the contract. I, I don't know. Uh, just seems a bit of a bit of an odd one, really, on, on, on that point. It's interesting what you were talking about with PSG because I think I'm right in saying that because Chelsea are in the Champions League, Zayic couldn't play in the Champions League for PSG. I think. Yeah, yeah, he could. But in league, uh, uh, as they say. Uh, Obviously, Messi as a false nine. I'm just wondering if they were going to do something clever, like if you could put somebody on the right wing to kind of so that Messi doesn't need to be there, maybe play him in. I don't know. It's just PSG is just a funny club. They just buy players that they don't necessarily need. Uh, I could have seen Zayic going to somewhere like Newcastle. I could see him doing well at Newcastle. Pacey, compliment Almiron, another player to sort of help push them towards top four. I don't know. So if you're if you're a bigger fish in a smaller pond, he might flourish. Yeah, you know? I, I was thinking that too, but PSG just didn't seem the right move for it. I find it very weird the the PSG move, and you can probably tell why. I probably thought about it when once it's been over, but is this really necessary? Yeah, well, <clears throat> what's necessary when it comes with uh, with PSG? But uh, but on stuff that was a bit left field, the one which kind of shocked me to a certain degree was the Cancelo one. I mean, that moved very very quickly. You go back a day or two, nothing. No hint, no semblance of a bust up, nothing. And in the space of a few hours, he's out the door, a deal's agreed, loan, option to buy, he's gone to buy a Munich. That just seemed, I don't know, there must be something under the surface there, surely. Yeah, so with the Cancelo one, I know Craig Hope released a story of that him and Guardiola had a bust up training. And we noticed um, when they played Arsenal on Friday, I know Hugh done the post-match 
had he referred to Cancelo as Mr. Cancelo. Now, if one thing you know about Pep is that if he refers to you as Mr. he basically hates you. So you were saying that all, you were saying that all the players he, um, he, was, he was referring to all all the players he mentioned as their first names, but when it came to Cancelo, it was Mr. Cancelo. And he, um, he pointed that out because we have like a group chat of like, um, for what is good all here, what is people like to push out. And and I was thinking, oh, was like, he's called him Mr. Cancelo, like, he's not in Pep's good book for the moment. And next thing you know, he's, he's out the door. And Pep is one of those guys, if you're not gonna, if, if, if you argue, not if you argue with a guy, but if you don't abide by his rules, you're out the door. And mm. it seems like they've had a massive bust up with Cancelo. So, He's going to buy a Munich now with an option to buy. I doubt I ever will ever see him in a Man City shirt again. For someone like you, then, or or you know, or you said that it wasn't necessarily your shift last night, but obviously you're still going to be um, sort of involved through the day. You're going to be talking about it tomorrow, undoubtedly. How do you react and process, and how do you sort of like discern? Like, like you just said, you know, you've got different reports. Some will say there's a bust up. Some will say it isn't. Some are trying to say it was purely just a case of a lack of game time. Uh, how do you filter through to present the most accurate reflection of the story to somebody who's listening to what you've got to say? Well, in Cancelo's case, I feel like we will have to talk about the bust up because we, we can clearly see like that is a factor within the story. And Cancelo is... If I probably think one of the best fullbacks, if not the best fullback in the league. So the fact that Pep is willing to give away his best fullback in his best fullback, I, I reckon it, there's something not right there. Considering he wants to go for a title title, considering he wants to go for a Champions League, something behind the scenes happened for him to go. I know Cancelo was angry now not starting against Arsenal, but I feel like everyone knows with Pep players, you just never know. All fantasy football players know you never know what Pep's gonna have in his lineup. You never know that what who's gonna start with Pep. So the fact that Cancelo they've had this bust up in training and the fact that Cancelo's gone so quickly it, it, it kind of shows that there wasn't there was something there that happened. We probably won't know the full story and I know like a bust up is very vague but at the same time that something has happened for him to have gone. If it was just gonna be alone, especially the five to uh, to buy option as well, I think is really key in this factor because if, if it was just you know what go away for six months because you need game time and come back, come back to me and we'll, and we'll go again next season, it, it, there would be no buy option whatsoever. But the fact is is that one, I feel like if they if I if I mean try to buy Cancelo right now, it would be 60, 70 odd million, which I know they can't afford. But in the summer they will be able to. So buy Munich has done the right thing and let let load in if he if he plays good for us, then we just buy him. Hmm. No, that it's definitely from from Bayern's point of view, it's good business. Uh, you're right that you know if you take the Sabitzer to Man United case as an example, that's just a straight out loan. It's a six month though. There's no option or obligation in there. Uh, so for there to be an option, which strongly hint that you know provided his attitude is good and his level of performance is good, you know Bayern probably will take that option up. Um, you're right that you know. For it to have happened so quickly would point to there being a catalyst it can't just be about the game time um you're definitely right about the the friday fa cup game omission because i've got a few manchester city fans as friends and especially when it comes to like european games they'll set they'll, there's no end of randomness that guardiola will throw there like against leon or like against chelsea um he'll he'll just play systems that the players aren't used to or different personnel or ditch a winning team for because he overthinks it so the omission on, against Arsenal isn't necessarily uh surprising I mean especially when Arsenal they're on fire so you probably want a um a solid back four there so mm. I wasn't I didn't read too much into that but the fact it happened so quickly you're probably right that there's there's been there's definitely something that's happened there um and of course now moving forward for the rest of the season i mean he's an experienced player like you just said one of if not the best fullback in the league over the last couple of years it's um he's only got about 18 19 players like senior players to pick from so that you know they're trying to rein arsenal in who have gone out and done some good some good business um 
puts a little bit more pressure on, doesn't it? In terms of can't really afford any injuries in in that regard. Yeah, I feel like Pep has. I feel like this season alone, he's just. If you actually just look at it in hindsight, he's just made this season so hard. I feel like <laughs> there's a there's a funny tweet I refer to where I think a guy randomly said he's. He said, I asked my landlord to increase my rent because that's how much I believe in my granny and hospital. I feel like that's been Pep Guardiola. Like this whole season, like you gave Zinchenko and Gabby Jesus to Arsenal and giving away Cancelo uh, to just make it harder for your title charge. You wanted to win three in a row, something that only Sir, Sir Alex Ferguson has been able to do twice. But now you've just, you, it's kind of like you're throwing the league away to Arsenal. I remember the narrative, the whole narrative was when Zinchenko and Gabby Jesus. Um, got sold to Arsenal. It's like, oh, he doesn't really see Arsenal with rivals. That's why he's giving those players away. But right now, they can find them with if they beat Everton on um, at lunchtime on Saturday, then they're eight points behind. Then they're eight points behind Arsenal, which that makes you think like, was it really necessary to give all these players away? And now you only have nineteen senior players. You still got the Champions League to play in. You're still in the FA Cup. Like. You've only made this harder for yourself, so I, I I don't feel sorry for him. But he must he must know what he's doing, or maybe he just doesn't care about the Premier League anymore. <clears throat> or he's trying to make it the most unbelievable win ever by saying, "Look, I lost three of my most experienced senior players. I strengthened a rival. I still won." And I don't know. Maybe he's trying to make it like the uh, the Man United Newcastle from '96 or the City United from. Uh, 2012 when they reined in ridiculous deficits maybe he's trying to do it like that and say look I'm the best you know mm. I don't know it's some sometimes he's some of his decisions are just you just sit there and scratch your head and you think huh really he's, he's a weird one you can never really quite know what's going on through his head as I said great manager and I'll never doubt that but there's just some some things he says and some things he does where you just think was well, that necessary like did you really need to do that but well, that's just that body over there to a team so with kickoff tomorrow, which, if I remember correctly, is 7 p.m. on Talk Sport, obviously you're going to dissect some of the, the movers and shakers and fallout from the transfer window. Uh, what else is going to be the, on, on the agenda? Because that's going to be a fairly broad discussion about you know what's going to happen over the next half of the season. What are some of the sort of the points that are kind of sitting on your agenda at the moment, away from just the ins and the outs? Uh, we're definitely going to have to look at Chelsea. I feel like Chelsea have had the most ridiculous transfer window <laughs> or January transfer window I've ever seen. I've been spending 300 million, um, over 300 million in January. It's been unheard of by the fact that they've done that and they've done it in such a way that no one's going to mention FFP because of these long contracts that kind of getting away with it in a sense. So we're definitely going to mention Chelsea as well. And um, Chelsea, I think Chelsea's a big one. We still have to even mention, you know, despite there was a transfer deadline day um, yesterday, Newcastle reached their first um, final in about 24 years. So that's that's a big thing for Newcastle fans as well. And for them to do it so only 18 months into their um, into their uh, new ownership shows that they're, they're on the right track. Like the fact they were third in the league in a cup final, they're really on the right track for this new ownership and for years to come they're going to be a force to reckon with I put, so I feel like those are the two agendas we definitely have to talk about like the way Chelsea have done this I'm quite worried about Chelsea I, and we all thought Chelsea were in the mud with uh, Tom Foley coming in and thinking oh you know what he doesn't know what he's doing this American guy coming into football trying to change everything but clearly he's coming with a strategy he's buying good young players I feel like he's just paying football manager in real life and it's going to come to fruition because there's buying a lot of players, but there's nothing like buying. If you're buying good young players, if some of them don't work out, you can still sell them for a bit of money. You can still get value. If you, if you sell players, if you buy expensive players that don't have that much value, don't have that much shelf life, it's going to be hard to get rid of them. But if you at least buy young players, you can nurture them, they can make sure on you, they can get the system, pay the manager, and if it doesn't work out, you can still move them on for a bit of the fee. You don't lose that money. So Chelsea have done really well in that sense to sign Enzo Fernandez. I think that's a really good signing to buy some money because I wanted Enzo Fernandez way before he went to that big at the start of the season. I know Man United were linked with him at the time. I think Ralph Ranjik, um said, well, Ralph Ranjik said that you, you should go get Fernandez and Kaiser and now look at them. But um, again, after the World Cup, he had a good World Cup. Obviously, one in the Argentina and the stock has just 
it's just gone through the roof. So to get players like that in, they've kind of sorted out. They've kind of done a rebuild, which has take normally two to three windows. They've done it in one January transfer window, which is completely unknown. So we'll dissect it and dissect, and dissect the way that they've done that and what that will bring to the second half of the season. A couple of things that struck me in that transfer window, I mean, you touched on Chelsea, but if you look at the continent and then you look at the bottom half of the Premier League, not a real a lot of business was really done. If you There was nothing really stand out in Europe. Uh, Caicedo, uh, sorry, Cancelo, I beg your pardon, is probably the most eye-catching name from elite club to elite club. Um, but there weren't really much... There wasn't really a lot going on. And I look at the, the bottom of the Premier League. <clears throat> I'm looking at Southampton, who made a couple of deadline day signings, uh, which they're, they're praying are just going to hit the ground running. They made a couple of other acquisitions through the month. Uh, no, nothing happened at Everton. They lost, obviously, Gordon to Newcastle. Bournemouth, there wasn't really anything eye-catching at Bournemouth. Uh, Wolves, I mean, not not a lot again. So you go to those bottom five or six... Leeds, Leicester, down to Southampton. Normally, you get more of a like a hot potch of, of players coming in and out. There wasn't a lot there, so no, there wasn't. There wasn't. I can't tell you. Wolves kind of done their their business earlier in the window when Lopetegui came in, but obviously they got um, Nunez, they got Pablo Sarabia as well. They also signed um, Mario Lemina, so they kind of done yes. that earlier in the window. Uh, Leeds as well, I've added Jorginho Rasta, they have added West Kenny to add um, head coach Jesse Marshes, bringing the Avengers to to Leeds, which is which is fine. Like I don't I don't I'm not worried about Leeds at, at all. But yes, as you you're right in a sense, Everton really didn't do much business, didn't cash in on that Anthony Gordon money, but then again they didn't have a long time to do that. True. Bournemouth as well didn't really sign anyone of significance. I know um Southampton signed Calvin Sulemana. Who again is a good player. I'm surprised that he went to a team like Southampton, and that's no disrespect to Southampton, but this was a good player, a good young player in Europe. Who I was thinking, and that was decent at the World Cup as well. I was thinking he was going to be maybe get a better team than Southampton, but here he is, final relegation battle. Good luck to him. And um, they signed a striker, Paul um, Owenachi, who is a Nigerian striker, who, listen, as a Nigerian fan, I've He's not our greatest striker. He's not even our backup striker. So, good luck to Southampton. Uh, I know he can do a job. He's like six or seven target man player of the game. So he does have some um, experience there in European football. But they, as I said, they just need to hit the ground running because right now they're going into a relegation battle. <clears throat> yeah, I've got no sympathy for him because um, or for Nigeria at all because the hottest dish I ever had in my life was cooked to me for for uh, by a Nigerian roommate at university, and it was so hot. I've never sweated before. I've eaten a fowl. I'll eat Middle Eastern food. I'll eat Mexican food. But when he cooked some kind of, it was like a, a, a chicken dish. It was exploding in my mouth. So if Nandi is watching this, fuck you, Nandi. Um, <laughs> but really, really tasty. But I probably lost my body weight in in sweat. So um, <laughs> so no no sympathies there. Um, but yeah, I mean that was. I look at Southampton. I mean we've touched on it there with a couple of acquisitions. I'm, I'm still, I'm still on the fence because they've they've seemed to have just gone through sort of defensive-minded players like nobody's business. They had Yoshida, they had Vestergaard, they had Forster and McCarthy as goalkeepers. They they're gone. Ryan Bertrand was there, so stalwarts of their sort of defence don't re haven't really been replaced. Oriel Romeo was was sort of like their linchpin, so it seems like they're overly reliant on James Ward Prowse. Um, obviously, they got rid of Danny Ings a while ago. They haven't really had like a potent centre forward, so I'm not sure if they've done enough. To I mean, look, they're only three points away from from safety, but I don't know. It doesn't feel like they've done enough to get like that injection and support Nathan Jones. What What do you think? No, I totally agree. I have them going down, actually. It's one of my ones to go down. I look at the other teams around them. I feel like they've got a bit more about them than Southampton. And it's unfortunate because Arsenal Hill built something there at Southampton and wasn't there to see it out. And Nathan Jones has come in. He's done a great job in Luton. Mm. I know he's a Southampton lad and his family supports Southampton. But I feel like the job that they've given him is just big. It's just too big. And especially in this crazy Premier League, 
where Bournemouth can compete with the likes of Asia Milan when it comes to signing players. I feel like if you don't sign players and you don't keep rejuvenating, you're just going to be fallen. You're just going to be found left behind. So I, <clears throat> Southampton are one of my teams that I tend to go down on board. I agree with you. I think Hassan Hootel was. Yeah, I, I think he was really harshly treated, not just by the board, but I think his media portrayal I don't think was particularly fair. He brought, you know, he came in, he brought an element of pressing with him. He got them to safety when they were in trouble when he came in. And he he lost all his best players. You know, he doesn't have mm. a budget to go and replace them. And I'm not sure, because obviously being European, I'm not sure what involvement he has in the sort of the transfer side. Because in Europe, you're more of a coach. You're given the players, coach them. So I'm not really sure he ever really had like a fair crack at the whip. He was always like with one hand tied behind his back. And I think you're right. It doesn't look like he ever lost the dressing room. And it's a shame he didn't sort of get the opportunity to see it through. Um, it almost feels like, and I don't want this to come across as disrespectful, but it almost feels like with Nathan Jones, they've kind of gone, if we go down, we've got a guy who potentially long term might get us back up. It's almost like a contingency. Maybe he's a little bit cheaper, wages and contract and the rest of it. So maybe they're already just thinking that it might... I don't know, it didn't strike me as um, some a club that was really aggressively looking to stay up because on the pressing side, the fitness and anything, if there was somebody who was available who was close to that kind of group, it would have been somebody like Bielsa. Yeah. Um, but they didn't go for anyone like that. So... I don't know. I, I'm, I'm with you. I think Southampton are really going to struggle. And then you look at Everton. <sighs> Not a single incoming player. Uh, they, they obviously decided to sack Frank. They've brought in Sean Dyche. And uh, they've actually given him a worse squad than Frank, obviously. Uh, Everton haven't been relegated for however long. Uh they they don't it's just it's hard to see where they're going to score goals and get wins from. Yeah, I agree. I think they're one of my teams to go down. I I don't do like Sean Dyche. I feel like Sean Dyche was doing a heck of a job in Burnley, but I'm looking at Everton side. Normally, Everton. This is only the fact that Everton even played up last season was I think down to the twelve man and Goodison Park. But I feel like that that's gone now. I feel like there's such a disconnect between the fans, the owners, the clubs, and the players. I'm looking at that team now and I'm not sure if Sean Dyer, I feel like Sean Dyer can get a bit out of them, but I don't think he can get enough, especially when I'm looking at the other teams surrounded by them, because not only do they need to stop losing against the other teams, they need to start winning against teams around them, and I don't think they can do that. Yeah, it's, I mean, for whatever reason, you know, Dominic Calvert-Lewin, they can't get more than a couple of games out of him, and then you're looking at Mapai. do they even have another centre-forward? Other than those two, no, they don't. And that's the worry because a Wobi isn't prolific. And do they really have some? I mean, Damari Gray seems to sort of flitter in and out. Yeah, I'm. I I, I think they are going to struggle. And you look above above them. Obviously, you you mentioned before Wolves have strengthened. West Ham looked like they might have turned a corner. They look like they found an extra sort of half gear. Uh, Leeds, obviously with McKenney, they've got reinforcements there. Uh, and then Leicester. I mean, you're talking one point separating those five or six clubs there. I mean, who who have you got as your third to go down? It'll be Bournemouth. Ooh, so as it is, Bournemouth. as it is. So yeah. Southampton, Everton, Bournemouth. It's it's unfortunate because I know as it is, it's just the easiest thing to, thing to say. But I'm just looking at it right now for what it is, and all, I think all those teams are going down. I think Leeds have a bit about them to stay up. I feel like Wolves. Lopetegui is a good enough manager and Wolves have good enough players. I know they don't score enough goals, but they have a good enough side to, to compete. I just look at those teams. Everton, they're, just, they're such a bad, ominous crowd along, along, uh, along Goodison Park, sorry, where I feel like they're going to just go down. Unfortunately, they have had too much to go like They have enough about them and I feel like they're kind of already thinking about the championship. And Bournemouth as well is that they didn't invest that much. The reason Bob Arthur left was because of the lack of investment. And I know like, they've got new ownership and we haven't seen much of that come to fruition. So I feel like they're going down as well. Uh, but it's not 
It's not like any day here cannot come back up. So like all, all three of those things in the morning paper will come back up. I'm just looking at this current climb up the Premier League. I don't see them staying in there. And then we've got that kind of middle group where we've got Villa, Palace, Forest. Again, you're talking a win or two and, and you know you suddenly start leapfrogging into the top half i mean forests have signed almost every player in the world over the last six months um some of them st- seem to start coming good gibbs white looks like he's found his feet now um they, they at times seem to be able to get a tune out of the likes of lingard they, they, they certainly try under cooper um who seems to have found his feet in terms of that like pragmatic approach of not being trying to go too gung ho or trying to be too defensive and keep things sort of nil nil, they seem to have found a decent balance. I mean, they were right near the bottom and now they're sort of thirteenth. So Forest probably are going to be all right, you would think. Uh, Palace didn't sign a striker. I know they signed that midfielder from Arsenal on loan, but for me, Palace's problem seems to be getting the ball in the back of the net. They just don't have a prolific striker i didn't see anyone linked with palace as a striker yeah i totally agree with you speaking to a couple of palace fans they just sometimes tell me i don't even start with the striker I and mean, then they have obviously odson edward and also i know Jim and i use not a striker anymore but used to be a striker they have odson edward they have the tetra as well you yeah. know like the people that kind of pay off up and, and sometimes um they don't even play with a striker so I feel like they rely on Zaha and Elise for their goals. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm actually going to the um, United Palace game this weekend. So I'll be looking at Palace because I still feel like Palace are a good side, but they're still yet to evolve under Patrick Vieira. I know they played to the style of football, but last season they got the exact same result that Roy Hodgson got. This season it's kind of the same mediocrity. So I'm really looking to see how they evolve under Patrick Vieira and how better, how much better they actually look. Because right now I'm seeing it and I don't really see, I'm not saying they're a bad side, but I don't think they're a particularly good side either. They're just going to stay in that mid-table kind of way, that 12-11 kind of thing, which is Crystal Palace at the moment under the era. I was at the Palace Man United game barely a couple of weeks ago, the 1-1 draw. And I have to say, although United generally, they had their foot on the ball and they looked the more composed of the two, I mean, Palace have got some excellent players with Eze, Elise, I mean... Um, uh, yeah, they're two, they're two men up front that you were talking about are a handful, although they, they, there's not really a goal threat. Uh, Zaha is always going to cause you, um, you know, uh, an issue or two with it, just with his directness and his pace. And they had the better of the chances. On another day, they could have scored a couple against United that day, but mm. but they're not. And that's the thing. It's it's just getting the ball in the back of the net. And of course, they, that that free kick was something out of this world, but. Uh, they, they, they do they do try they're getting the ball in the areas it's just getting it in the back of the net so I, I agree until they get somebody up front they are going to just hover in that sort of mid table not pushing for Europe not getting relegated that kind of so so land kind of thing and then you've got Villa who just look unrecognisable since Emery took over it seems like you've I've forgotten time under Stephen Gerrard they look like they've clicked and they've gelled well and they're getting a tune out of the likes of um, Bailey and well, basically everyone there just looks like they've raised their game. I mean, they're only a point behind Chelsea. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I think that when Gerard really had them in the relegation rele- 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 zone where Emery's come in, he's getting a tune out of them, which, which is good. I think that's what good managers do. That's the difference between managers like Gerard and Lampard and this no offence to them but I just don't feel like they're that elite level type of managers to do it in the Premier League and once you see when a real manager comes in you can see the difference in how a team plays and how it can be more times it can be the same players that they're playing rubbish under a manager but when the new manager comes in and gives them a style and gives them the confidence they look like a completely different player so I see that's what's happening with Villa and Emery at the moment and then into the top 10 as you just said uh, a team who have almost done an entire Premier League's transfer windows worth of business by themselves, Chelsea. Um, I did a couple of videos beca- about Graham Potter before because I'm a big fan of Potter and I think uh, he was an easy target, you know, earlier on walking into that difficult situation and people say, oh, he's rubbish, doesn't know his best team, get him out sort of thing. And I was trying to defend him. Uh, and I know that they've been up a bit up and down and whatever, and 10th and is not where they expect to be. But 
how, what's your making of his situation? I mean, obviously he's got almost an entire team's worth of new players in a short space of time. Um, their form's been a bit patchy. Obviously, they've just really invested in youth, like you said. Do you expect to see a big shot in the arm and Chelsea really start knocking in the Europe, possibly even top four, but certainly in the European sort of places, second half of the season? Um, I don't, unfortunately, because as much as Chelsea are a good team and are going to be a much better team than what we've seen in the first half of the season... For them to knock on the door of the Europe, we still need either Man United or Newcastle to drop points. And right now, I don't see any of them dropping points in Chelsea capitalising. However, I feel like you'll see the fruition of Chelsea's fruit, I should say, or we should say, like, we'll see it next season. I think once this team has gelled, once all of the players come in, we've still got players like Evan Kuku coming in, mm. we've got Marlo Gusto coming in from Lyon next season. So I feel like once we see those type of players coming in, once that's when we'll see the best out of the Chelsea side. And it all depends on Graham Potter. This is a really big test for him because he came in and he looked terrible as the new Chelsea manager. And like I'm just gonna keep I'm, I'm just keeping it real. I think Graham Potter's a good manager. I feel like he's done a great job at Brighton. But what I'm seeing right now is that Roberto De Zerbi is even look, looking like he's doing a better job at the moment. So so now in, this is a real big test for Graham Potter to see if he's actually that guy or not because we all like to, especially in the Premier League, we all we all, we all love a what if. It's like it's Man United but it's Moyes. What if Moyes done a good job with Everton? What if we gave him more money and and he went to Man United and that didn't work out? What if this manager has more money and and uh, he'll perform better? But unfortunately, stuff like that doesn't happen all the time. And we've done it with Graham Potter. What if Graham Potter gets a big job or what if Graham Potter gets uh, get, get some more money and he can do this. So we really need to see right now if Graham Potter is actually that guy or if he was just doing a good job for Brighton and if Brighton's just his level. And that's that's not bad because Brighton are a very good footballing side. Like, let's not get pissed. I saw Brighton slap up Man United at Old Trafford at the start of the season. And we've seen Brighton and take it to the cleaners like two or three times against Liverpool. So, so that, um, that's no disrespect to Brighton to do at all, but we need to really see right now if Graham Potter is actually that guy to take Chelsea to where they need to be. Do I think he is capable of that? I don't, but I wouldn't mind him proving me wrong, but at the same time, I just don't think he has the minerals to manage all these players. Fair enough, they're young players, so I feel like he can get a bit out of them, but I just, I just don't think he has the minerals to be a top, top level manager because right now in the Premier League, you're going to have to be competing with our second if he's finally got his team. Have to be competing with Klopp. You're gonna have to be competing with Ten Hag. You have to be competing with Pep Guardiola. And these are guys that have not just done it in their league; they've done it in Europe too. And Graham Potter's not even sniffed Europe yet. So this is just a guy who's just, who's just doing good in the South Coast and doing good in the Premier League. So he really needs to see if he can make that next step to be an elite manager, which which I don't think he will. But at the same time, he needs to, he needs to prove me wrong. <clears throat> the biggest thing I took there was the exclusive that Christian and Cuckoo is actually going to sign for Chelsea. So I'm going to take that as gospel. Yeah, well, I think it was, I think it's completed now that he's going to sign for Chelsea and he's coming in the summer. I know that it was one of those ones that were, it was getting um, linked. He was linked with at the start of the summer window, but they said it was That's right, yeah. for, um, for August. But I think that one's officially, it's practically done. <laughs> I think yeah, because he's because done. he's got more than six months, he can't officially sign a pre-contract agreement, can he? No, he can't. He can't sign a pre-contract agreement. He's got more. He's got less than six months. So it's, it's. But I feel like it will be announced by by summer. Well, I'm going to take it as gospel because Tony Afoke has basically said it is done. Doesn't matter what Ornstein. <laughs> doesn't matter what Fabrizio says. It's on. Remember that. It's on. So no, and Cuckoo's coming to Chelsea. On on the point you were raising there, I mean Chelsea's a funny one because obviously Tuchel won the Champions League there. And he's he's got minerals. We've seen that, you know, across Europe. But Chelsea was struggling under him before Potter joined the, you know, came to the party. And we've seen Arteta after obviously the cup run where they basically just played counter attack and Aubameyang was out of his world for about three months. He was under severe pressure with the Arsenal fans for the following season, wasn't he? They were quite negative. They weren't getting the results. He's not the right man. Blah 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 blah. Do you not see? And I'm just playing devil's advocate. Do you not see some parallels that if Potter is given just a bit of time, that he might coax something out of these players a bit like Arteta has? Or is he just not made of the right stuff? Um, 
Yes and no. I feel like the reason Arteta got given time was because he came from he was Pep Pep's right hand man, and Pep praised Arteta with a lot, mm. and he learned so much under Pep, and he was in a winning. He came from a winning school, if that makes sense. He came from the right environment, and then changed everything at Arsenal in which, even though Arsenal were having the worst time under him, they still gave him time because he changed so much and he changed so much of the culture and they believed in it and he won that FA Cup in his first six months so they kind of believed him in regards the unfortunate thing about Graham Potter I feel like if you do give someone time they'll get their team and they'll play much better football than they're playing now however I feel like what we're asking Graham Potter is to do that under Chelsea and what we've seen is that Chelsea don't really give people time like I know it's under new ownership but the fact that they got rid of Thomas Tuchel how spending all of this money, I feel like Chelsea look at this from a money situation. How If Chelsea keep performing the way they've been performing at the start of the season, I'm not saying they will, but if they keep doing that, I don't expect them to give Graham Potter time. Because if you look at it as a money perspective, I spent all this money and then, and you're not giving me the results, you're going to have to kind of go eventually. And if the fans don't get behind him, then, then it's only just a ticking time bomb. So it's as I said, it's up to Graham Potter. I don't think he personally has it because he has to compete with the top elite level managers. I'm not saying he's not a good manager. I think he is a good manager, but there's a fine line between a good manager and a new manager. I just don't think he can get to that elite status. Mm-hmm. And even if it does, it might take him a couple of years. Because I look at all these signings now. Has Graham Potter asked for all of these signings? I'm I'm not sure he has. I know like Chelsea are signing young players and they and they have a way of signing them. But I don't look at this team and feel like Graham Potter has had his his say in all of this team because Chelsea still don't have a striker. Out of all this three hundred million they've spent, they still don't have someone to put the ball in the back of the net. They still have to kind of play either Jao Felix up front or Kai Havertz up front, which was kind of their issue at the start of the season. So I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if Graham Potter is going to be the guy to see this thing out. If he does, then fair enough, and he's. Um, prove me wrong but I just don't see it happening I kind of want him to because for so long we've been sh- like shouting give an English guy a chance an English guy's never won the Premier League and now we've got a British manager young progressive British manager in one of the big jobs I do want him to succeed because I want us to be able to say that we do have quality coaches because our coaches just get knocked like you know the media took Roy Hodgson to the cleaners, but he was revered on the continent. Um, Southgate, at times, is, uh, I don't want to say a laughing stock, but we don't have the same admiration for our own as we do, like you just said, with Guardiola, who's on this pedestal, Klopp, who's on the pedestal. So I kind of want Potter to succeed almost as like a like an, a door opener, and maybe we mm. might get more English coaches. Like we've, we've, we've had such a big thing for inclusivity sort of in the media across genders across ethnicities and all the rest of it we've got a big push to try and get black and asian coaches sort of into the game open doors for them but we we've now got one sort of lone figurehead for british coaches in top jobs and i kind of hope that he does all of them justice so that the next wave like a nathan jones if it doesn't go his way you know, outside of his control, he still gets an opportunity within the Premier League, you know, at a decent sized club, not just a Leicester or a Villa or whoever, actually one of those big, you know, the recognition, you know, like you said, Potter did a great job at Brighton. Now he's got the opportunity at at, uh, at Chelsea. So I'm just hoping Eddie Howe as well, you know. I, that's what I'm saying. I feel like Eddie Howe's the one, if there's one that's going to pave the way, I feel it's going to be Eddie Howe rather than Graham Potter. I feel like what Eddie Howe has done with this 18 months of Newcastle mm. is, is ridiculous. And I feel like that's a show between a, a good coach and a coach that has done a good job. And I'm not saying that Newcastle are a bigger club than Chelsea. Obviously, there's a lot more pressure to be Chelsea's um, manager than it is Newcastle. But what since Eddie Howe has come in, Newcastle have been in Champions League four. They've been in top four form for nearly a year now since the start of last January. So the fact that he can come in and do that type of job and with this with this new ownership as well is only gonna get is only gonna get better and better for Eddie Howe and Newcastle. And Newcastle will give it a couple of years now they're gonna be competing for that title and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Eddie Howe's gonna be in the forefront of it. So I feel like if there's one 
manager, it was one British manager who kind of paved the way for us to kind of be at the out. You do make an excellent point, and you look at since, like you said, the, the the last October when the deal went through, and obviously Newcastle was sold, they haven't gone out and spent stupid money, whereas Chelsea mm. have gone out and spent is it almost six hundred million? Yeah, and they're in tenth. And you've got Newcastle, whose net spend is probably maybe a tenth, if you take the net spend into account. And they're sat third with, you know, the third best goal difference in the league. So it's not, it's not like they've just sat there and been stingy. You know, they still scored goals as well. I mean, one just going on your point about Chelsea, about the whole money spending thing. I mean, one thing that hasn't changed is we still don't hear from the ownership at Chelsea. So we, we haven't heard from Todd, just like we didn't hear from Roman. So I don't think we know anything really about what Chelsea are are planning. We seem to speculate. I read an article this morning that they were they want to take on the City group. They want to take on PSG, Real Madrid, Man City. And apparently they might look to buy other clubs as well into sort of like one of the like City did with in in, in America and in Australia, uh, to create that city group of clubs. Apparently there's rumours that Chelsea might be doing that. Have you heard that? I've re- I remember reading the article about that when Bowley first came in, and that's why they bought some of these young. Remember during the summer they bought like some of these young players that have not even played for Chelsea yet to kind of do that, which will be it will be good in a sense because that's kind of uh, again that's helping other teams and that's kind of rivaling the City group in a sense. But it it all depends if it actually happens or not. If it does, I. Uh, do I see it happening? Maybe, but I feel like it'll be a long time before it actually actually happens. Mm. You also mentioned that Chelsea, obviously, with that American sort of viewpoint on it, definitely see Chel- Todd and his his people there. Definitely see Chelsea as much about the brand, not just about the football product. Partly, probably, why they've got these assets signed up for such a long period of time. Do we have any indication of how long he's going to stick around? Not that I know of, you know, but I don't, I feel like if you're investing this much into a club or into a brand, I feel like you're going to be here for a long time. I know one thing about Todd Bowley is that when he invests, he wants to see his thing come to fruition. I remember, um, obviously, with his MLB side, when they won, when he invested a lot of money into that, kind of like a money ball situation if anyone's seen the film. Mm. They invested a lot and he saw his team win at the end of the day. So I feel like he, they'll want to see it they'll want to see it through. I feel like if you spend six hundred mil in like less than six months or so in two transfer windows, you're 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 looking to there must be a budget behind it, right? There must be a reason. You're not just throwing money at it like, okay, you guys this is the money, here it is, do what you need to do with it, and I'm just gonna go by the off and you you gotta do what you do. They they clearly Look at what they need. They clearly feel like they have a plan. It's an expensive plan, but it's a plan. And I feel like they're going to go through with it. However long that takes, I don't know, but we'll see. Interesting that you talk about your plan. They identify players that they want. Um, obviously, part of that plan is probably if there's a really promising player like Mudrick, they don't want Arsenal to get him, which is fine. And in other instances, like in Cuckoo or the opportunity with Jao Felix or Fernandez, they go, yep, we have a need. Let's let's go and grab him. Speaking of a of a club that was that used to do that, but doesn't seem to have addressed some of its needs now, Liverpool. What's gone on there? Because they've spent forty odd million quid on a forward in Cody Gapo. And I can't understand why. When they've clearly got issues in their midfield, which they haven't addressed. And it can't just be about Bellingham, because they've got the money to to spend they've spent as i say 40 odd million on gakpo but they didn't go and sign anyone in midfield this is the thing right i first of all i need to address this better though i don't know what liverpool fans have done but i feel like we've just all assumed that you're going to liverpool because he's taken a couple pictures with Jordan Henderson in the World Cup. Here we go. I'm just going to clear everything because we're going to get an exclusive here. So no, so, no, no, there's no, there's no, 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 no. This is this is going to happen. This is being broadcast all over the internet. I'm calling up the radio stations and saying Tony's told me. No, I just don't. I just don't think he's coming to Liverpool. I just don't see any reason had to. And I definitely don't think if Liverpool don't get Champions League football, I doubt you better than going to move to Liverpool. The issue with uh, with Liverpool 
though, is I I don't want to be one of them guys, but there's no smoke about fire. If anyone knows Jurgen Klopp, is that for teams he's managed with Mines and Dortmund and now Liverpool in his seventh season. I knew it. I knew the seven year cycle was coming. I knew it. And like listen, I I don't I don't want to keep saying it's the seven year itch or the seven year cycle, but if things have happened twice now, it's happening a third time. Hmm. Do you not learn from your mistakes? One thing what I used to love about Fergie is that even though we were at the top of our level for years and years and years, we kept improving. We kept on moving. We mm. win. We win the Champions League. We go sign Berbatov. We lose. We lost the league and goal defense. We go sign Van Persie. You need to keep improving your squad. I remember even Pep giving an interview to um, Pep giving an interview to uh, Rio Ferdinand, saying that how, he asked Rio how many league titles did you win? Six. And he's like, was that with the same squad? No, it wasn't. You have got to keep improving because that's because people. You put yourself here, people are going to keep getting up and up and up. And if you, do, if you don't keep carrying on, they're going to catch up to you. And that's what we're seeing with Liverpool right now. That midfield is aging, that midfield is odd. It's old. Fabinho has just regressed terribly. And they've not improved. And this was the window for them to go sign a midfielder, at least. Like, I'm not saying they have to go sign an Enzo Fernandez, but they had to go sign a midfielder, at least. And the fact that they haven't done that, I don't see them reaching Europe this season. And I'm so... If they don't reach the top four, they don't reach Champions League. Why would you then want to come to Liverpool? Like, I, I don't, I don't get it at all. Like, I'm looking at they wanted to sell. They were the FSG were the first to come out and say they wanted to sell. Now Man United have come out and said they wanted to sell. So the potential buyers that were buying to Liverpool, they're like, hold on, we've got a bigger club than Man United. Why am I going to go buy? It? Now some of them are looking at both, but it's that sale should have been overshadowed by the Glazers announcing that they're willing to. Sell. So it's not really looking good for Liverpool at the moment, and they just haven't improved. And the fact that they go spend 40 odd million on Cody Gakpo just goes to show that you're clearly strengthening in the wrong areas. I don't think Cody Gakpo is a bad player. I know he hasn't scored or assisted with him yet, but I don't think he's a bad player. But it's just not what you need. And I, I, this is the thing I don't think football is hard. I feel like teams and clubs make a meal out of it. I think everyone. Every man, woman, and child and his dog can identify what a player needs or what a team needs and what a specific need. So I'm not sure what they're doing in the club. Everyone knows midfield. Everyone knows Liverpool need to um, rejuvenate that midfield, but then you go sign a striker or go sign a winger that you want to play the striker. Like it just doesn't make sense. So that's on Liverpool to be fair. And if they don't seem to improve, they're just going to find themselves falling short this season, which is a shame because. I would like to see Man United in for the top of the games. I feel like that would be a good. But now I'm looking at it, I'm thinking we haven't beaten them at Anfield this season. I expect to go beat them at Anfield because this just isn't a good team at the moment. That's really interesting. I mean, you've you've hit quite a lot of points there. Um, off off the pitch, then. I mean, what I've not seen from Klopp, and I'd followed Klopp when he was Dortmund manager. And I saw him build that that first team, and obviously they got to the Champions League final, and he really took the fight to Munich every year. But what I didn't see was uh, him, like you just said, part of that Ferguson formula that Guardiola has taken is you purposefully dismantle your teams because they have cycles. You either do that when you've won the league and you strengthen. Or like in 1995, when they lost on the last day of the season, you you take your team apart and you build another one. He did it in 2010, I want to say. I think Chelsea did a double that year. And he built what turned out to be that last, you know, semi-decent side. Uh, I think he won it in 2011 or 2013. Yeah. Um, so Ferguson was the master of that rebuild. And changing his philosophy, not being so stuck at playing 4 2 3 1, 4 4 2, 4 3 3. He, he changed his personnel, wide players, inverted wingers, a front two, 1 1, whatever it might be. He always seemed to get the most out of the players that he, that he had. What I haven't seen from Klopp yet is the ability to, if you've got a really decent group of players, change it through a, either in, like Chelsea have done, just here's an open checkbook and do it all in one go or over the course of a few transfer windows get that next wave of team 
And then you mm. look at the fact that they've lost the likes of Wijnaldum. Never replaced Wijnaldum. They've lost Sadio Mane. Haven't replaced Sadio Mane. So some of the most important players in that team haven't been replaced. And I just wonder, I mean, I'm looking, I'm looking at the midfield. I want to say it's either four or five years since Liverpool signed uh, for, for money, Thiago was free, a midfielder. And that kind of coincides with the old assistant manager, um, that Bouvach guy, the, the guy who had the long hair, leaving Liverpool. Yeah. He left very, very abruptly just before a Champions League game. And um, obviously they went through a bit of a rejig there. But I'm just wondering if there's any coincidence between Liverpool's transfer structure changing then you know, they just signed the Salas and the Mane's and Firmino's and Fabinho's, all that that core team. And I just wonder if that's had like a coincidence that they haven't addressed um, like the holes in that side. Like you just said, 40 odd million Gakpo, good player, but they've just spent 60, 65 on Nunes. Do they, did they need to spend that money on Gakpo? Was there not more of a pressing need to, to sort of fill the midfield and like you just said even if you're going after Bellingham there's nothing stopping you from getting a second or a third player to complement that but they but they haven't done that you know Fernandez was available at the start of the season that's a great that was a great shout by the way um if they're going to miss out on somebody like Casido I'm sure there were other options there that they could have gone for but they they haven't so I don't know it just seems a bit all over the shop it looks like they've put all their eggs in that one basket you know, the, the Bellingham basket. And like you just said, if Real Madrid came in with a really good offer, if you were Jude Bellingham, who would you go for? I want to be a bit biased. Here we go. Say Man United. <laughs> but and will, will, will Man United go in for him, though? That's the question. Well, this is the thing. I feel like before people forget that we threw the franchise at Jude Bellingham way before he went to Dortmund. We invited this kid to the training ground. We bought Fergie out to come and say so we we clearly been on the two and has for a long time unfortunately back then we were rubbish like and so i don't blame him for not going because man united was a toxic place at the time but if we look at it if man united get champions league football if we get new owners we can throw the idea of two better than you're a great player come bring back man united to where they're supposed to be and at least we know you're going to play Champions League football for Man United. Man United have new owners. You're going to be surrounded by good players. They've got a good manager now. Man United on the up again. Come be the face of the franchise. Which, which is not a bad thing. Like, if I'm Drew Bellingham, that's not an, it's not a bad, obviously it's a bit biased, but you're going to be the face of a franchise of one of the biggest clubs, if not the biggest club in the world, who is starting to be on the up again. He might be back. So that might be a good, that's like a good selling point. And Man United have been, I felt that Man United are just going to give up on Jude Bellingham considering he literally invited his dad to Old Trafford a couple of years ago before he made that move to Dortmund. We were trying to get him from Bergen and City. Bergen even came out. Bergen wasn't even with us at the time and they even invited him to come tell him about Man United. So Jude Bellingham knows what Man United is about. But one thing I think is that he will make the best decision for him. I feel like the guy is a very, very mature player just on and off the pitch. So I feel like he'll make the best decision for him. I don't think he'll put himself in a situation where it will be a detriment to his career. And right now, if I'm looking at that in comparison to Liverpool, Man United, and where they are, Liverpool without European, without Champions League football, Man United is Champions League football, I feel like that's a no-brainer. Obviously, there's other teams. There's Man City, there's Real Madrid. But then again, the Real Madrid need them. They've got Aurelio and Carmeni and Camavinga. Valverde as well, they don't really need them. Barcelona, do they really need them? Who wants to go into the Premier League? It's either going to be Man City, maybe Chelsea, if they are in the Champions League. But I doubt he's going to take away Champions League football just, yeah. for, just for the money. So, whatever team has a Champions League this season, <clears throat> kind of have a shot if you better than I also just wonder if... Um... Being based in Germany, great place for young players to develop. We've seen it with Sancho, we've seen it with Haaland. I just wonder, um, does he take a view on the Premier League? Because he's only, what is he, 20? He's, he's 19. 19 still. 19 still. Yeah. So do you say, do you know what? I'm going to sign a three-year contract with somebody like Bayern Munich. Go and play with his ex-best mate, um, 
Jamal Musiala, because they grew up together, mm. win the Bundesliga a couple of times, play in the Champions League a couple of times, and then it, at 21, 22, you can reassess, have Liverpool improved, have United improved, where are City at? Because again, he wants to play every week. Would he play every week at City with De Bruyne, with Foden, with Gundogan, with Bernardo Silva? Real Madrid, you made a great point. Barcelona, you made a great point. Liverpool, not in the Champions League. So I just wonder, you know, all the best players in Germany eventually end up playing at Bayern Munich. I just I just wonder, it, does he take a punt for a couple of years, win some stuff and then come to the Premier League? I don't know. To be fair, because he's so young, he could do that. He can literally stay in Germany for another two, three years win some more and then by the time he's 22 which is still very young in his career he's still eligible to win PFA that young player of the year so exactly. he can still do that <laughs> yeah so he's still he's still got time there I feel like we don't even have to make the assumption he's leaving in the summer but well, that's what Dortmund do they always they always have that big sell or one year in the summer and it was Harland this year I feel like it's going to be better than next mm. year and the next year might be used with the Coco or so on but they always just have that one, that one massive sale per year. But yeah, you're right. He can literally stay in Germany. There's nothing stopping him from staying. And then on the longer term side of Liverpool then, you mentioned the seven year cycle with Klopp and how difficult it can be if you miss out on Champions League. I can't imagine Tottenham being as bad again next season. I can't imagine Chelsea being as bad next season. It's going to be very, very competitive at the top of the league next year no guarantees they'll they'll qualify next year either uh the sale was an or the intent to sell was announced three or four months ago and there's not really been any movement that we're aware of on that side is there any possibility i know he only signed an extension half a year ago whenever it was but is there any possibility that klopp may I'm not going to say he's going to walk, but he's, I think he signed a deal until, is it 2024? Is there any possibility that he doesn't see that out? See, if the sale becomes protracted and Liverpool continue not really to make inroads? If that happens, I feel like it's very unlikely. I feel like one thing he won't, he won't get sacked by Liverpool. But mm. I feel like it could be possible that he will, but there's so many factors that have to happen for, him, for that to happen. So, for instance, the sale doesn't go through. Liverpool are still in this little pickle that they're in now, and it gets so bad where this season happens again next. This season that they haven't happened again next season, and it still doesn't improve. Then I feel like Klopp might walk because we'll get to a stage where the fans will get uneasy. I'm not saying the fans will walk Klopp out, but the fans will get uneasy. The place will become a bit toxic, and it will just be good for a fresh base to come in. Who that fresh face is, we don't know. But if it, well, again, there's so many things for that to happen. There's so many things that have to happen for that to happen. I doubt it will happen, but I won't be surprised if it does. If they don't change things, it's, it's just interesting what you said there about you know fresh voice because there seems to be with most managers you get sort of five six years and they say oh it's time for a fresh voice and then you have Sir Alex who was there for almost twenty seven years. I don't remember anyone saying that there needed to be a fresh voice there. So just kind of testament, you know, with that whole thing you were talking about with the cycles and everything, that for you know a quarter of a century he was able to keep that that going. Um, immediately above Liverpool, I mean, I look at Brentford, Fulham, Brighton. I mean, you were talking about what De Zebri's done there. Uh, I mean, it's not beyond the realms of possibility considering they've got two games in hand and they're only five points behind. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that Brighton finish above Tottenham this year, which would be unbelievable. Could you imagine Brighton in the uh, UEFA uh, Europa League? It would just be amazing. Uh, they they've seemed to have done some business. I mean, for Brighton, obviously keeping hold of Casido was huge. Trossard wanted to leave. They've got Rid, got some money in for him. Fulham have made some some signings. They look like a solid team there. Silver's doing a good job. Brentford, I I don't understand how Brentford on the tidiest budget are still punching sort of top 10. They're there on merit as well. Uh, they seem to have been had some stable stable windows. No one's taken any of their biggest players. Yeah, that's true. Like, with Brentford, no one's taken, no one's taken their players, and Brentford seems to just 
get some wins as well, but they have they they just make smart signings and just keep them going, and then they can sell them on for however much. But yeah, Brentford again punching above their weight. Fulham are having a very good season under Marco Silva. There's some good players in Brighton as well. Again, it's funny because Brighton signed so many good players where so many success stories. Like, look, they could have got rid of if I told you Brian got rid of Trossard. Like a couple of years ago, I'll be thinking, oh, that's going to be a blow to them. But the fact that Matoma and what he's done so far, they don't really care that Trossard's gone. And they've just signed a new guy now. I'll tell you, I can't pronounce his name and I've probably never watched him play, but I just know he's going to be a good signing because Brian just don't make bad signings. So I just know, yeah, he's going to be, he's, some Premier League clubs going to want him for like 80 million come next, come the next 18 months. But that's just Brian, the way they do things. And he's a big credit for Tony Blues and the ownership of what they do there over at Brighton because they seriously have a good recruitment system and they're seeing the reward of it. It just looks like ever since they moved to the Amex, they've just been the best run football club in the country. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're in the black. They've been resilient to COVID. Um, they don't go and break the bank when it comes to signing players, like you just said. They are... Like the modern day Arsene Wenger, they just uncover gems like you wouldn't believe. They seem to be extremely well coached, so the the managers they go for seem to be perfect fits for what what they want to do. Yeah, they just they just seem at the moment they've got the Midas touch, but it's not just like the last couple of months. This has been something which has been going on. I mean, the only time I can think of them panicking was when they got rid of Chris Hewton. I think that's the only time I think that they were like, oh God, we need to do something here. But apart from that very small period, everything has just been, I mean, you couldn't say anything less than like a nine out of 10. It's just been an amazing period for them. Out of um, Brentford, Fulham and Brighton, who would you say is your manager of the year out of that small pack, considering how unbelievably they're all doing? I would say Brian's manager was lovely because no one expected it. Because Brian played good football, but I feel like we all felt it, that was down to Graham Potter. Mm. But now that Graham Potter's gone, it looks like they're playing even better football. I know players like Solly Marsh have been improving. Solly Marsh even came out and said that he's preferring a football under the Derby than he's done on Potter. So I would say the Derby because no one expected it. I know with with Brentford, we, we saw this last season, and I'm not saying I mean, that's not to discredit Brentford at all, but we saw Brentford are a good side, and we saw they've got a bit about them to stay in the Premier League. <clears throat> Fulham as well, again, Fulham's a great shout because, again, coming up from the Premier League, we all thought they are going to be that yo-yo, yo-yo club and just go straight back down, but they've kind of got rid of that, and they're looking really good. But I would say Brighton, because no one expected this. And that kind of fills into my next thing, because I'm looking at Tottenham, who... They just seem perennially to just be nearly men. It looks like, again, they're going to miss out on the Champions League. Uh, Conte. So they signed a fullback. Um, they still look a little bit short, in my opinion, and I think that is partly down to him. The handbrake just seems to be on for too long. There's rumours pretty much everywhere you go that he's going to leave at the end of the season. And I'm just looking at that chasing pack of Brighton, Fulham and Brentford. I'm just wondering if one of those is going to be the next Tottenham manager, because they all seem to be playing a better brand of football than Tottenham. And it almost seems like an inevitable parting that Conte is going to go. Mm. No, I agree. And I feel like it should have been... I feel like the next manager before Conte got, uh, came, I feel like the, the old so Graham Potter should have been Tottenham manager. I feel like that would have been the next step for him. Like, as a good club, a good up-and-coming club. Not a good up-and-coming club, but... A club that's just not there yet, but it's a bit, it's a level above. It's the right, it's the right step. So uh, yeah, if I think if any of those managers, if Marco Silva, Thomas Frank, or the Derby do go, I feel like Tottenham's their next step in a sense. But really and truly, I don't see any of their managers leaving whatsoever. But like, Thomas Frank loves Brentford. Brentford loves Thomas Frank. I don't see him leaving. Marco Silva's doing a great job at Fulham, and Roberto De Zerbi's only just four or five months into his job at Brighton, so I doubt he moves. So who who do Tottenham get next? I feel like Tottenham fans want Potch back. I feel like they feel like they have unfinished business. The Tottenham fans and Mauricio Pochettino. So we'll see if Conte goes back. I wouldn't be surprised if I see Potch back as well. 
That's an interesting shout. That's a very interesting shout. It's just this. There's just this old adage, isn't there, in football that just don't go back. They yeah. just and oh, I I said it to the Tottenham fans don't go back, but a lot of them do. They don't go care. Back. Even though yeah. Mar- Mourinho went back to Chelsea. Yeah. So I mean, look if it, if it didn't end well the first time, obviously Levy and Poch and you know they got rid. Uh, it's what makes you think there would ever be a different outcome if such a situation materialised again. You know, but part of that original issue was Poch felt there was an agreement for a transfer budget, didn't he, after the Champions League final and that never materialised and they sort of fell out and you just kind of get the feeling with Tottenham that they get so far but they're not prepared to take that next step. So I think that's where Conte feels frustrated. I think to where Poch felt frustrated. I just wonder what, what would make him think that it would be different the second time around. I, I, I don't know. No, I neither, neither do I, but I feel like Poch just... I feel like Tottenham fans had their best years on the Poch. And that's what they want again. As much as they're in the Champions League with Conte and they made Champions League with Conte, they feel like the feel-good football and that Champions League final and the best years they've had on the row, even though it didn't come with a trophy, they had that with Poch. And what Poch brought them from and to where he brought them to, they feel like if they do that again from a better base, and a better like starting point. They feel like they can do that again. Whether it happens or not, I don't know. Well, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens with Poch. Well, how about this? Because the next six months is going to be interesting. According to you, Graham Potter's a dead duck anyway. So Graham Potter gets the sack at the end of the season. That's a, a Tony Afoke exclusive. Uh, Potter becomes Tottenham manager because Conte is going to leave. And then there's an opening at Chelsea with all of that talent, they've got the most prim, uh, expensive Premier League footballer ever, who just so happens to be Argentinian. Just saying. Pochettino, Argentinian. Just saying. Uh, they bring in Poch, and all of a sudden, the world's a happier place. Because look, Tottenham, is it like three ex-Chelsea managers they've had recently or something ridiculous? It's It just seems yeah. like, yeah. So why not add Potter to that mix and then give Pochettino the chance to manage a big club? Just saying. That would... That... If that happens, I don't want to say I told you so, but, but I don't mind. I can see that happening. Uh, and then club very close to your heart, Man United. So obviously we spoke a little bit um, before we started about United's business. Um, it, United are up for sale, um, typical Glazer fashion, rather than try and make it the best potential and most attractive uh, prospect by giving them access to assets commercial assets who can sell shirts and give them the best possibility of being in the champions league which of course bumps up their value the glazers have decided they want to spend any money and so rather than consolidate united have been left you know squeaky bum time they have brought in their horse as he says um otherwise known as the horse they've brought in um Zabitza on loan from bayern but that was only because ericsson got injured um, have United done enough, do you think, to kind of get into that top four? It's still very, very sort of threadbare. I mean, if Marcus Rashford gets injured, they're screwed. If Casemiro gets injured, they're screwed. Uh, I just wonder, have they have they done enough so that if they are a player or two short, uh, they can bring somebody else in to maintain that level? Um. No, but I feel like United have done enough with the means and what they have. I feel like because we are now up for sale, there's no point of spending more money because that's going to, if we spend more money whilst we're up for sale, the new owners are going to have to take on that debt. And unfortunately, we're in a lot of debt as much as it is. These new owners are going to have to, well, buy the biggest franchise in the world, the most expensive franchise in the world. Two, they're going to have to invest heavily into this franchise because one, the, the stadium's crap, the facilities are not that great. According to Ronaldo, we still have the same chef and Wi-Fi password that he did when he was when he came in the team. <laughs> so there's so many things, there's so many things you've got you've got to factor when it comes to buying Manchester United. So right now in the January transfer window, we we couldn't afford anything, and especially with us, with, we spent nearly, nearly, I think we spent maybe two hundred mil in the summer. Nearly. I know Anthony was like 85, and Sandra was like 45. As well, Casemiro was like 60. So we nearly spent 200 mil in the summer. And 
So we didn't have that much of a budget left in January. So the fact that we've got those three in, we need a striker because Martial is barely going back in the season. So that's fine with me. It's their course. He's coming, he's coming in to do the job. You are right in a sense that if one of these players like Rashford or Casemiro gets injured, we are practically screwed. Um, would that affect our top four chances? Yes, hundred percent. But I still feel like we're going to make top four. I feel like if Ericsson didn't get injured and we never got to so I still feel like we we would be kind of fine in a sense. But I, I don't know. I I honestly feel like Man United have got enough because Ten Hag doesn't rotate anyway. Unfortunately, and obviously rotate rotation is key, I and mean, we we're still in a lot of competitions. We've probably got a game every three days, so we've, it's going to be a lot, and he's going to have to rotate in some games and and not rotate. But let's just hope with, without any major injuries or major concerns. I feel like Man United do do make the top four. It's kind of interesting because if United are going to go for the sort of money that's being floated around, we're talking billions. Then, if they'd spent a hundred million quid on a couple of players, you it almost doesn't it almost doesn't add to the expenditure if you're going to spend that sort of money. And if it guaranteed you top four, if it almost guarantees you winning the league cup, getting to the latter stages of Europa, that makes United an even more attractive proposition. I would have thought, um, unless, like you said earlier, United are just saving up to really go hell for leather for the likes of Jude Bellingham then perhaps there's this kind of method in the madness there um i mean you look at united's midfield and i'm just throwing it out there obviously ericsson's injured basically until the end of the season uh Sibitz is there for six months um you've got fernandez vander baked out obviously there's casemiro and then you're, you've basically got mctominay and fred that is basically the man united midfield um i'm a huge fan of caicedo I think he is somebody that would walk into any of those top four clubs. I think United probably have the biggest need out of all of them for him. So if I was Ten Hag, I would be going hell for leather. He seems to love Frankie de Jong. I expect United to go back in for him. Um, does that leave a place for Bellingham? I don't know. I just don't know. I just I look at United now. You probably need five real quality. If you're going to play a three... You need at least five players in your squad who could, at any stage, like rock up and 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 play. I don't think United have got that. Uh, he likes dynamic number nines. He always says that Martial is key to how he wants to play. So they're definitely short there. They don't have another sort of dynamic number nine. Again, Veghorst looks like he is a a stopgap. Uh, so I think United. I don't want to say they need major major surgery, but they're still. I would say some positions sort of up for grabs there. I know that you've um, you've interviewed Harry Kane before, so I'm guessing you're Agent T, trying to get obviously Harry up to up to Old Trafford. I I, I guess that's what you were trying to throw in there. Uh, no, I have no, I'm not, I'm not. Don't lie now, don't there. lie now. No, not at all. I would rather Victor Oshiman. I love Oshiman than Harry Kane because as much as I think Harry Kane's a good footballer. I don't want to get the latter years of the guy. I feel like if there was, if there was, if I wanted to see Harry Kane in the Man United show, I want to see his prime years. And I'm tired of Man United signing strikers one above the age of thirty and two people out of their prime. We, we keep doing that. I don't remember the last time you signed a striker that was not thirty or above thirty. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. It might I'd actually be see. Martial. It might have, yeah. I think it might be Martial, which is that 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 that. That says it all, really, doesn't it? So, and that's no disrespect to Harry Kane. I feel like he will come and do an amazing job at United, and he will be, he will literally be the difference between us competing for a top four or maybe competing for a title. But I feel like Victor Oshman is kind of everything that Ten Hag wants right now. He's killing it in Syria, and he's one of the upcoming strikers. He's only 23, so this is perfect. What well, sort of uh, um, what sort of money are we talking? And let's 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 ignore the fact he's Nigerian for a second. No bias there, yeah. of course, on your part. Uh, what sort of money are we talking uh, for Osimhen compared to Kane? Kane, it depends who you read. 70, 80 million quid, uh, still with a year left in his contract. What would Osimhen look look to be fetching? Osimhen will probably be around one hundred and twenty 
120 of you, I think, for him around. And that's because of one, he signed for Napoli around 70 mil when he moved from Liga A. And two, he, when he signed for Napoli, when he played there, he should have been scoring goals. And once, and once you do that, and he's going to lead them to a Serie A this season, they're already top goal scorer and they're already top of Serie A. So they're going to try and cash in for him, which is fine because by signing. 120 million for a 23, 24 year old isn't the end of the world because you're buying, if you divide that up in the years, you're going to have him. Again, it's not the end of the world. So I'm not really too fussed about spending that type of money for Oshman. It's interesting because he's he is prolific. His record is better than one in two. It's not Harry Kane numbers, but it's it's still not to be sniffed at. I just wonder. And I'm just throwing it out there. Why did Man United, when you considered there was that release clause, not try and get, especially when they knew they were going for Ten Hag, not try and get Erling Haaland? Was it was it such a dead, a dead cert that he was going to go to Man City? Well, the Erling Haaland thing with Man United was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's plan. So we were linked with Haaland before he went to Dortmund, and Mina Raiola was his agent at the time, mm. but. The reason we didn't sign him is because of the release clause. Man United said we don't do release clauses. And Minero said, listen, he's only going to be here for a couple of years and then he's going to have a release clause in his contract and you have to abide by that. If you want him, then it's going to be a release clause. Man United said no. So he went to Dortmund instead. And now even still with City, he has a release clause in that as well. I know in two years' time he can be signed for a, he can be signed by a foreign club. Do we know or, what the release? Do we know what the release clause is? How much? Um, I can Google it. I know it's like a hundred mil or so. That's a steal. That's an absolute steal. No, um, let me quickly Google it just to make sure. I've um, I've got some French friends right in the heart of Paris, who are uh, PSG mad. Um, oh, two hundred. So two two hundred million. Two hundred so hundred seventy five mil. Okay, that that's still. Not bad, considering he'll guarantee you at least a goal a game. I mean, that's... Yeah, exactly. uh, so the, the, the PSG fans that I was just talking about, who pretty, pretty close to the club, are saying, and there's a real threat and worry here amongst PSG supporters, that uh, Mbappe, he's made it clear he wants to leave, uh, hasn't had any suitors, which is why he's still there. Uh, he's basically said, given a come and get me plea to Real Madrid, who... Uh, firstly don't have the money and secondly need to get some players off the wage bill in order to be able to afford his wages but he apparently is open to the idea of joining Man United there seems to be some kind of respect between him and Marcus Rashford not where sh not sure where this bromance has come from have you guys heard anything about the possibility of United signing Mbappe? I've heard some things however again there's going to have to be if that ever happens there's going to have to be so many factors one is going to have to be on the new ownership under Man United. And two, yeah, I know him and Rashford have his little bromance. Like that. Probably did it stem from when we knocked him out of the Champions League that time. Mm. However, I I find it very unlikely. I will happily have it. I will happily take it. But at the same time, there's got to be so many things. It's got to be a statement signing from new owners if that's ever going to happen. And mm. Mbappe is going to have to force his way out. Will I take it? Yeah, 100%. Because who would have taken Kylian Mbappe at their club? But I don't see it coming to fruition. I feel like United will rather go for a central striker rather than Mbappe who kind of prefers to play off the left rather than playing up front. I'm just, I mean, again, just looking at it and they were talking about how he would fit in and whatever. You've got a fairly fluid striker in anti Martial who has missed um, something like two thirds of the last available matches that he was he was even possibly available for. Um, so you can't, you just simply can't count on him. Um, and again, if you played a fairly fluid front, line which again they make a similarity to when united had berbatov and tevez and rooney and ronaldo they just all seemed to it was like jelly they just seemed to run around and at one point ronaldo would be up top and berbatov would be in a hole and rooney would be over here and tevez over there they're saying could you imagine uh 
a front five and take your pick who you want to play out of Rashford, Mbappe, Anthony, Sancho and Garnacho, you you would just basically say, oh, give up. I mean, that, yeah, that, that, I'll, that, I'll, that I'll, group I'll, of players all under the age of 23. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would love that. Could you imagine? And then if United do go and sign, I mean, they probably would give up betting at that point, but I can't see why they wouldn't sign De Jong. I can't see why they didn't sign Caicedo. You've got Bruno there. That suddenly becomes a formidable team. 100%. If that were, if what that happened, that would be the main United that we want to see, right? That would be, they'll be an amazing player, the fluid front three. That would be the main United that will be competing for every, I don't know, if Ten Hag would there are okay, that team will be competing for everything with both of them. He'd be so happy his hair might grow back. Can you imagine what it would <laughs> can you imagine what it would do for the league to have Kylian Mbappe here? I mean that is he is the it's such a shame that Messi's never going to play in the Premier League. Um to have arguably the next best player in the world here mm. would be I mean, him versus Haaland every week would just be ridiculous. Can you imagine the race for the golden boot? Especially at Man City. Oh, United mate, can, well. can you can you imagine? It, it would be like Van Nistelrooy Henri from back in the day. He scores one, I have to score two. He scored a header, I have yeah. to score an overhead kick. He scored a Corpion, I have to score from the halfway line. It would just be... It would be mayhem. I, I just think that would be amazing. Amazing. Um, Newcastle, who level on points with Man United... Likelihood is those two are going to go head to head in the League Cup final, barring one of the greatest turnarounds you've ever seen. Um, they 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 haven't done a huge amount in this window, but they have kept hold of their best players. Bruno, I'm sure people were sniffing around him. Amazing season. Saint Maxim, he's a handful. Surprised that there wasn't more interest from others in him. Almiron, I could have seen Almiron going to Arsenal. He's that kind of live wire. Spanish speaking, um, but so they've done very well to keep hold of everyone. Um, obviously, they've let Shelby go, although he hasn't really featured. But that's somebody in midfield that you know might have come in. To, especially now, Bruno is going to be suspended. Um, have they have they missed a trick by not bringing anyone in? I mean, there's only three points covering them and Spurs. I know that they've got a game in hand. Bruno missing for a couple of games, an injury up top, you know, those kind of things. They've they let Chris Wood go, haven't really replaced him. Have they weakened themselves in this window? Um, I don't want to say weakened because I don't I haven't seen anyone from that starting eleven kind of gone, in a sense. Mm. And Newcastle don't concede. They don't they don't score enough for me to like consider them a threat just as yet, but these guys just don't concede. And Eddie Howe's coached them so well in a way that they're a hard team to beat. And I feel like they've done this process properly. Once you're a hard team to beat, and you sort out your back line, and you make it difficult for teams to get at you, then you can start worrying about going forward. Because we all thought, okay, Newcastle, they're now the richest club in the world by far. They're just going to sign all these players. They're going to find Mbappe, they're going to find Messi, they're going to find all of their things, and do what basically Chelsea have done, but on a greater scale. But they've been so smart about it and they're building a team and anyhow it's building a team from the back up, which I think is the right thing to do. Because right now it's them to be third. And I said well, I said earlier in the episode, they've been in Champions League form for a very long time. So the fact that they've it's not just been this season, it was the um it was from January last season when they brought Bruno Gumarez in that he's he's come in, he transformed that midfield and they look like an actually decent team. So I really see Newcastle, I feel like they're making top four this season because I just don't see them losing a lot. They're just a very hard team to beat. And I know they've got a lot of draws, but they still only lost just one game this season. And that was to Liverpool in literally the last dying second of the game. And really, truly, they shouldn't have lost that game. <coughs> that's yeah. the only game they've lost that season. That was, that was very controversial. I, rem I remember seeing that. And um, I, 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 again, it just, it had... You know how some games have got something written about them where you can almost s smell like something's going to... It had that kind of controversial winner where they were playing three minutes extra beyond the stoppage time. And yeah, I I, I could see I can see that. I can understand where you're coming from on, on that specific point as well. I mean, only five teams have scored more goals than them this season. No one has got anywhere close to them when it comes to the goals conceded. So you're absolutely right that it's not just a case of 
sitting back and hitting teams on the one nil. You know, they are, you know, they score three times as many goals as they concede. So they are, they know how to play and they don't have a prolific number nine. So, um, yeah, perhaps their, their stroke of genius is keeping hold of all those players and no injuries that I'm aware of to anyone key. So they've kind of got full steam ahead for the second half of the season. Do you, do you see the sort of the top four finishing in its current order? Yes, I do. To be fair, I do because I don't. Unless Chelsea go on a massive run and even Newcastle or United fall off, I don't really see any of them pulling out of the top four right now. I feel like because May United again have made themselves harder to beat. I know they lost to Arsenal, but other than that, post. Since Ten Hag has come in and changed the side, they've only really lost to Villa and Arsenal. Other than that, they've done quite well, so I don't really see them losing at all. No, I don't see them having the top four staying the same. No, it's a very good point you make there. It's a very good point. On the Manchester City thing that we spoke about earlier, they've got a small cushion to Newcastle. Um, Haven't reinforced. I don't know if they needed to. Um... They've obviously, they, they still can't play Mendy, so he's effectively not part of the squad. They've got rid of Cancelo that we spoke about earlier. They've got a very small senior squad to attack on three fronts. Uh, have they missed a trick? Is it surprising that they didn't go after anyone? There wasn't any murmurings at all about any business incoming-wise. Um, have they have they missed a trick? Had especially with Arsenal reinforcing, have they missed a trick in terms of either for the Champions League or FA Cup or to try and reel Arsenal in? Um, should they? I feel, have... I feel like they have. I feel like when you lose those type of players, you've got to improve. However, I just, I still feel like they'll be fine Champions League wise. It's just the league where I feel like they have to go in week in week out and. And beat teams and hope that are capitalizing on Arsenal mistakes. I feel like they haven't given themselves the best platform to do that. When it comes to cup competitions, I feel like they're fine. I feel like they've still, even though these teams were quite thin, I feel like they've got a much better squad than the majority of the teams they're going to play against. It's just going into league week and week out, capitalizing on Arsenal mistakes. I don't think they can do that with the, such a thin squad. The other thing which I found interesting was. Chelsea have sort of gone on this spending spree. Uh, I fancy Newcastle with Champions League will bring in a few as well. Obviously, we've seen Liverpool, their their transfer business we spoke about earlier, unless they're putting all their eggs in the Bellingham basket, just seems to be a bit... Well, it, it's not on point at the moment. United are broke, as we said. It's going to be an interesting challenge for, for City because I think Chelsea will sign more in the summer. So, what do they do? Do they look to bring in players now? Do they wait to see the lay of the land in the summer? Surely they've got to think about reinforcements because that midfield, especially, is getting on a bit. I think they're all, all their key players are sort of touching 30. Rodri's no spring chicken in that regard. Gundawan, De Bruyne, Silva. Uh, there's surely going to have to be some incomings to Manchester City you would have thought and although they've always been very good at setting like a ceiling for where they would be prepared to pay that ceiling seems to be going up all the time the market rate seems to be driving up they're surely going to have to be like activity at City I just I just find it a bit peculiar that there's nothing they've just kind of gone we'll take what we've got and and, and run with it it just I don't know it's um they they've lost three senior squad players um, you could argue maybe Jesus because they've got Alvarez was the least important, but Zinchenko, considering in the fullback areas or midfield reinforcements, and Cancelo, uh, I don't know. It just seems they just seem to be getting themselves weak. I mean, they might be arming for a rebuild, but I just don't hear any murmurings of what that might look like. Yeah, and neither do I. To be fair, but I I don't doubt in the summer Guardiola will make some signings. There's one manager that knows what he wants and knows the, knows the type of particular player he wants to beat up Guardiola, but I don't doubt that Man City will sign some reinforcements in the summer. It's just interesting because if we're talking about money, you've got Newcastle, now that they're in the Champions League, so in terms of proportion of their revenue, 
that will give them an ability to uh, compete with City when it comes to the money side. Chelsea, it looks like they can compete on the money side. So it's going to make. I think it's just going to make it harder, um, especially with Arsenal. You know, if Arsenal win the league, Arteta, like you said, was his right hand man. Suddenly, Arsenal become a very attractive proposition. So it's going to become more competitive when you're looking to negotiate with a target than ever before. That's why I thought maybe they would try and steal a march now before those other you know potential destinations become more attractive and and the prices get driven up furthermore. Just seems a bit of an odd one. Don't know. And then on Arsenal's front, they look like they've had a pretty good window. They've reinforced pretty much throughout that team. Obviously, Chelsea were happy to let Jorginho go on deadline day because they were signing Fernandez. So he looks like a steady Eddie. They signed that Polish defender to reinforce the back line. They brought in Trossard, of course. And they still got Jesus to come back. Would you say that they've had a good window, Arsenal? Um, I won't say they've had a good window as because they didn't get any of their number one targets. Yeah, Caicedo was their number one target in that midfield role, and Mudrick was their number one target in the winger role. They filled in positions that they need, and they've improved their squad, and they've done what they needed to do. But that's is that a good window? I'm not saying it's a bad window. I'm saying it's uh, it's the win. They've done what they needed to do, so they can tick their boxes and say, "Okay, we got this. We got this. We got this." But for you to not get your number one targets is is a bit of a concern. I know some Arsenal fans are concerned about the Jorginho, excuse me, the Jorginho signing and the Madrid signing because of uh, they're not they you know what you're getting across Arsenal. You've seen in the Premier League and you know what you're getting with Jorginho. So they've done what they needed in that sense. And they're obviously replacements for players that if, say, Parker gets injured or if Martinelli or Saka get injured. But if you were linked with all these players for so long, I know they don't want to overspend, which is one thing Arsenal don't um, want to do. They don't want to overspend. But I feel like they're just getting players that, okay, we couldn't get this guy, so let's just get this guy instead. If that makes sense? Which, which isn't... The worst thing, but I'm not saying Jorginho won't come and do a role at Arsenal, and I feel like he will, and I feel like playing under Arteta and he will look much better than, than he was when he was playing under Tuchel. But one thing I do think is just like Arsenal didn't get the right, they didn't get the ones that they wanted. Arteta didn't get the players that he wanted, and Edu had to go and make, go and get other replacements, which is not the end of the world, so they'll see. They've got the squad now. I feel like now if part of the thing is they could fit Jorginho in and it won't lose that much of that team aspect and the Arteta ball. But I'm just looking at it. Are those really the signings that they want? But at the end of the day, I feel like they're top of the table. They can't complain that much. So they should still get... I feel like this these, this window will bring them over the line. It's kind of interesting when you look at it from that point of view because they obviously identified those players, like you said, didn't get them which is a fair point. Um, and they've almost had to go to the second choice or whatever was available. Uh, they've improved their squad. You're probably right to say, have they improved their first 11? You might say, maybe not. In the case of Mudrick, one of Saka or Martinelli would have to be dropped because you'd have to play him every week for that sort of money. One of the things that Arsenal have been really good at is in different areas of the pitch they've had units and you know that front three have worked really really well together if you disrupt that with that potentially that, that might have had maybe a negative effect in the sense that you've got to build up a new relationship um obviously Odegaard as the main playmaker would have to get used to where Mudrick wants the ball um I'm just wondering sometimes if it ain't broke you don't fix it kind of thing mm. um in the case of midfield, I kind of I kind of get the feeling that Party and Caicedo do a very similar role. So one of them would change ever so slightly. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, probably certainly an upgrade on Jacket anyway. Um, so I, I I don't know. I'm just thinking. Certainly Caicedo and Party together is a formidable double pivot. I, I would certainly agree with you there. Jorginho is a really clever footballer. Um, 
So definitely, like you've said, they've probably done enough to get them over the line. Have they done enough to improve their core 11? I will probably agree with you that they haven't. But but their, their core 11 so far has been the best in the league, I think you would have to say. You don't, you're not top after 20 games unless you are. So to kind of consolidate the squad, uh, give themselves a bit more depth. That's why I was just asking, is it a good window in that in that regard? They haven't broken the bank. They've brought in three or four players. Like you just said, if that gets them over the line to win the league, surely that's got to be worth it. Uh, therefore, you'd say that was some some good decisions. Maybe not the, 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 op the optimum, but certainly enough for you to, to, to win a league title. Surely would be you know considered good I, I would have thought especially after almost 20 years of going without winning the league yeah 100% I think if you look at it in that aspect they have had a good window they've done what they needed to do and eventually they've improved their squad as well which is I think was their main key because there, there was a, they didn't really need to improve their starting 11 and their core 11 was fine but it was all about improving their squad and they've done that even if they don't have the players they will do exactly they still improve their squad in the sense so if we're looking at yeah, at that aspect, I do, I do reckon, yeah, they've had a good window. So, obviously, you're going to be pretty busy, as you just said. you still got the fallout of the transfer window. You're going to discuss the knock-on effects of what Chelsea are doing. What's next in terms of your diary and, and things that you're going to be discussing and where, sort of over the next coming weeks? How's it looking for you? So, it's, it, all, it all depends. We've got Next month we'll have a EFL Cup final to talk about. We'll have the Premier League, Champions League is back next month. Europa League is back next month. There's so many games coming thick and fast. The Club World Cup is coming. I think the first round is today, but we'll probably be talking about that in the coming weeks. So there's so much football coming along where we're going to start building, not building towards the business end of the season, but we still got a bit of time for that. But building towards where we're starting to see what teams are about and where they're going to end up finishing. There's going to be so much we're going to talk about in regards to that. Cup finals to come, knockout stages of cups to come, fifth round, sixth round of the FA Cup. So we've got we've got a lot. So there's a lot. I'm looking forward to it because it's kind of we're kind of getting to near the culmination of the season. Obviously, we haven't spoken about managerial sackings yet. There hasn't been a huge number, really. Um, do you see if some of the clubs sort of mid-table or get sucked back towards the relegation zone, do you see maybe one or two potentially losing their jobs? And obviously, that would give you more things to discuss, especially if there's more meat on the bones with something like a Conte story or something. That That's something, of course, which you would discuss. Um. In the Premier League, I don't really see any managers getting sacked now. I feel like if you look, but the ones in the relegation zone, I feel like they're going to ride it out. The ones above them, so like you say, you're not going to be going to look because they've just got a new manager. I don't think pa Palace is going to sack Vieira because I feel like even though they're in that just dark cloud of mediocrity, it has to get really bad for them to... Um, be sacked, so I doubt like there's going to be an actual major managerial sacking. Like you never know in the Premier League. True. I mean, there was talk, of course, of, of unrest between Brendan Rodgers at Leicester because they haven't had any money for a while. And I could see if he became available, we were talking about Tottenham. We were talking about maybe one of the three clubs: Brentford, Fulham, or Brighton. Maybe being of interest to Tottenham, but of course, if. Brendan became available, I could see him walking into Tottenham. That's the sort of a, a right level club I could see chance to work with somebody like Harry Kane. He's worked with Jamie Vardy. Um, I, it, it, I could see him potentially becoming uh, available as much of a mutual parting of ways as anything. Yeah, that's just if Leicester had the money to do it. Because I feel like, and I, I don't see him leaving Leicester anymore. Only reason is because I know Leicester was so bad at the start of the season. I feel like if they were going to sack him, they would have sacked him then. And I doubt that Leicester are going to get as bad as they were at the start, at the end of the season. Now, I know they haven't really improved that much. They've got a couple of signings in. And, but I don't really see... Brent, if, Brent want, if Brendan Rodgers walks, I think he'll walk during the summer. But I don't think he'll walk mid-season. I only think he walks if he sees an opportunity for a bigger job. 
but I don't really see Leicester Saka moving in because I don't think they can one can afford it and two they really want to at this time. And in terms of like the product, the entertainment and the quality, we've had a mid season World Cup, which is unlike anything we've ever experienced before. How would you sort of surmise and rank the Premier League at the moment for quality, either collective or individual, for excitement and for entertainment? Would you say it is it's maintained or improved, got worse? Where, where do you currently see it? Um, in regards to quality, I don't think it's gotten better. I don't think it's gotten worse because I feel like quality-wise, we've seen teams like Liverpool finish second with 97 points, which I think is unprecedented. I don't think we're ever going to see that again. But I feel like the product is nice because we all, at the start of the season, all thought Man City were going to run away with the league. And no one expected Arsenal to have this run. No one expected Man United to have the start they have and then come back with it. No one expects Newcastle to be the top four just yet. So, story wise, in the product of it, we're starting to see a new shape of the Premier League. I feel like next season, especially with Liverpool decide to come back, if Chelsea decide to come, excuse me, to come back, we're going to see like a proper top six. Where I know we have this top six race or so what, but now we're actually going to see a proper top six where you're either in it or you're not. So we're, so I feel like this season is going to be a massive, nice kind of build up towards next season and see how big that season is going to be. So you think we might be in for a busy summer then? A lot of incomings and outgoings player wise, and the Premier League is probably going to be the place if you're a player to come and play most most probably. Yeah, hundred percent. 100%, especially after the World Cup as well. We've seen that all of these players in the Premier League after the World Cup and a January transfer window. And let's see in the summer transfer window how teams are going to be moving and let's see how what players are going to be moving, how teams are going to get better, who's going to be in the Champions League, who's going to be in Europe. There's going to be so many different things to just the normal traditional top six that we've had. There's going to be, going to be a massive shake up, so I'm really looking forward to it. And then on that sort of drama, entertainment, and product side, VAR has been in the news over the last few weeks, obviously. There's been so many controversial decisions and so much inconsistency. I mean, do we have any idea how they're gonna how they're gonna sort of start filling that gap or improving that situation? Because you've got similar situations where one week a goal or a decision is given and the next week it isn't, or even on the same weekend, two very similar incidents being referred with very different outcomes and it seems like the players and the fans and the managers they part of their frustration is they just don't know it's, it's very difficult to play if you don't know what the rules are going to be or if you anticipate how a decision's going to go how do we how do we get past that um clarity clarity is the only way and i think that's down to the pgmol and the people that work in bar but like if there's a clarity with their decision to why they made that decision. I think that's the only way because everyone's interpretation of VAR is different. And I see video actually they use in other sports, but there's a clear and concise clarity towards it. We know why that was given back or why that was taken away. But with football, because the rules are so vague and the rules are not concrete, and then we use VAR with that as well, it's all about the interpretation of the rules. So until we get clarity with the rules one and two what we use bar for and what they see and why they've made that decision then i don't think we'll solve the issue that is bar at the moment it just means that there's more things to argue about in the pub isn't there really which is part yeah, of the exactly. fun anyway <laughs> apart from seven o'clock tomorrow on talk sport for kickoff where else can we catch you over the next couple of weeks what other shows networks are you going to be on talking all things football or, or beyond um I'll be doing some of the quick, quick sports version on Times Radio, but that's just like leading up to like the FA Cup and stuff like that. And also, I'll, I'll just report on the Sunday morning, I'll be doing a bit of an EFL preview as well with Natalie and Cass. I think it's Natalie and Cass, I'm not entirely sure, but I'll be Sunday morning. I'll be um, doing a little EFL preview as well, or a little, a little review as well of the EFL. So, yeah, I'll be doing that as well. And I'll be doing that over the next couple of weeks or so. So, yeah, okay, looking forward to it. That's a very full plate when you've got another 70 odd teams to add to the Premier League already. That's, <laughs> a, that's a lot of games that you've got to watch and review and, and, and summarise. Yeah. 
But there's worse teams than um, Natalie Sawyer and Tony Cascarino, I suppose, to be a part of. That's always, yeah, exactly. if you're hungover, that's always a good show to kind of listen into for sure. Exactly. And in terms of like interviewing, um, like I said, I referred to the fact that you've been to Tottenham before and you've interviewed the likes of Ledley King and Harry Kane. Uh, uh, is there any opportunities where you'll be at other clubs with other players that we can catch um, asking similar kind of insightful questions? That all depends on who I get given to. So like that day, like at the start of the week, the Premier League will be like, okay, before you can do the deep interview, you can do this, you can do that. So it all depends on who on who you get given. So you might hear some stuff being played out on shows, and then we get to, like we'll go there interviewing through the week and then play out on a show. Or do a press up, but it all depends on who it gets. It just happens on the week, so that's how we find out. Well, so, I don't know as of yet, but whoever it is, look forward to it anyway. Well, seeing as you're going to the Man United Palace game, it would make sense for them to give you Man United, wouldn't it? Because then you can actually. It would, it. but I'm. It would, but I'm going as a fan. Oh, I so see. I'm I knew you were going to drop that. The, yeah, micro yeah. the microphone's always on, though. Just take it in your back pocket, whip it out, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> just flash the yeah. press pass. That's what you need to do, flash the pass. It's true. I'll, I'll just take my accreditation and see, and see if I can just get any in the now. <laughs> what we'll certainly have to do is, um, now that you've given your predictions and you've given those exclusives, the likes of Nkunku and others, um, we'll certainly have to get you back before the season's out to see if your predictions are accurate. And um, also, I mean, something which is massive since COVID is talking about things like mental health, dealing with anxiety, dealing with how you kind of keep cool and deal with stress in the greater world as, as well as everything that's happened. So definitely getting your thoughts on how you personally deal because you, you're in a high pressure environment. You can be, you can have shows at different times around the clock. Uh, that can lead to a certain amount of stress and obviously, you know, your voice or you're being seen by thousands or millions of people. So again, just just talking about how, what anything that you might do to kind of deal with that and kind of maintain mental health, that that's also things that we talk about on the channel. So getting you back to talk about that would be really interesting. Um, and if it helps with anyone with their tips, then that's also um a really really good thing but also more importantly just seeing how accurate your predictions are we definitely have to get you back in a few weeks time especially when champions league and europa league are back and you can gloat as to after united have beaten barcelona i'll give you that opportunity <laughs> uh, i hope we do i'm not sure if we will but i hope we do nice one but in the meantime tony i really appreciate you taking the time out of your day um and to anyone watching, I will include all of his handles and links to the shows, uh, like Kickoff with Talksport, in the description. Um, I highly uh, encourage you to go and listen and watch because uh, he's very insightful, and he's one of the few journalists who doesn't spout bollocks. So that's that's as big that's as big an endorsement as I think you can you can possibly have. But I really do appreciate you taking the time out to speak to us today. Um, Thank you for having me. And for everyone else, I will catch you again soon for the next episode. So in the meantime. You will take care.